I'd like to invite you to join me in a bit of a mystery today. And by mystery, I don't mean a mystery that is going to be solved like a riddle or a, a mystery that gets figured out like a murder she wrote, a who done it, where we figure out at the end who did it. I'm talking about a mystery that really needs to be lived, a mystery that needs to be experienced for us to begin even comprehending it and its power in our lives in the very here, in the now, on our journey of faith. The mystery I'm talking about is the mystery of resurrection and what that means for our lives. Jesus and the Sadducees had this great debate about what resurrection was. Sadducees didn't believe it. Jesus certainly uh, believed it. He was it. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. And so I want us to uh, enter into a bit of that mystery together today, to explore it and, and to really spend some time with it today. It's a, a central piece of our faith, and yet only at Easter and perhaps in the days following Easter do we really dig into it. So here when Luke's Gospel presents us this discussion about uh, uh, resurrection and it shows up here in November for us, I thought, let's spend some time entering into that mystery of resurrection together. And I'd like to begin uh, to explore that mystery of resurrection not from the other side of the open tomb. I want to really explore the mystery of re resurrection from this side of the open tomb, this side of Easter. In fact, I want to, to begin exploring that mystery of resurrection in that liminal time. That liminal time between this world and the next, when we might feel like we're on the doorstep to what comes next. I want to explore the mystery of, of Easter from that threshold place between this life and the next, because I believe that that's, kind of, for many, a thin space, right? A, a time and a place where the curtain that seems to separate our lives here from the eternal gets pulled back just a little bit and we catch a glimpse of what's coming, maybe one of the clearest glimpses of what's coming after uh, Easter itself. If your family is like my family, somewhere in your family history you have stories, narratives, or accounts of family members who were visited by predeceased loved ones before they passed away. Maybe it was in the days, maybe it was in the weeks, or even the months before that person died, that they were visited, or they said that they were visited by a loved one who had already died, or a group of loved ones. I was thinking about uh, Beth's mom, Fern. Uh, we had taken her to the hospital uh, one day. She was in relatively good shape, but she was experiencing some problems. We said, uh, well, let's take you in, get some tests done. This was a full month and a half, maybe two months before Fern passed away. And she's waiting in the hallway on a, a kind of a gurney, a, a bed that they could roll into the lab to do these tests. And I'm standing in the hall with Fern, and we're going to have a prayer together before she goes in for these tests. And when I finished praying, she said to me, Mark, she said, Mark, I think I'm losing my mind. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you don't see all the people standing around this bed, do you? I said, no. She said, well, all around the bed, I can see family members of people, family members who've already died. There's my great aunt so-and-so. There's my great uncle so-and-so. My mother is there. My father is there. And to be honest with you, my first thought was, am I stepping on somebody's toes? <laughs> We got all the ancestors crowding in around Fern's bed. I, I sort of felt like when you go through a, wa a walk through Colonial Cemetery, some of you remember back in the 90s they did a sonographic uh, reading of Colonial Cemetery, and even though there's only about five, 600 tombstones there, uh, beneath the ground they found that over 10,000 people are buried in Colonial Cemetery. They say no matter where you step in Colonial Cemetery, you're stepping on someone. I kind of felt like that when I was standing by Fern's bed. Am I, am I getting in the way of the predeceased ancestors who've come to Fern that day? 
My response to Fern was simply this. Fern, if you're lucid enough to think that you might be losing your mind, maybe you're not losing your mind. Maybe the ancestors have gathered around your bed to bring you comfort and peace today. It was a month and a half or, or two months later that Fern passed away. Some of you know that my own father, when he was in the hospital receiving treatments for cancer two or three weeks before he passed away, was in his bed and we were sitting around the bed one day and my dad kept doing this. He kept putting his head over his shoulder looking toward the corner of the room and I said, Dad, what are you looking for? He said, there's someone in the corner tell them to come out. I can't quite see them. They're just outside of my peripheral vision. I said, Dad, there's, there's nobody there. He said, sure they are. Just tell them to come forward. Now, my father was not on any mind-altering drugs at this time. He was receiving steroids and some treatments for cancer, but that was it. But one morning when the oncologist came into the room, my dad said to her, I know why you've come today. And she said, why? He said, you're going to tell me you're going to stop treatments today, aren't you? And she said, yes, I am. How did you know that? He said, the voice in the corner finally spoke. It said, Bob, it's time to come home. Friends, there, are an, there is an overwhelming number of accounts and stories of your family and mine and others through this world who get to that liminal space that thin space where the curtain between this world and the next gets pulled back a little bit and loved ones show up, loved ones who've been gone for a long, long time. Why do they do that? We don't know. We know that it certainly seems to provide some comfort. Maybe it provides a, a, a bit of a sign for us about this mystery of resurrection. Just a number of years ago, there was a a uh, famous thanatologist named David Kessler, a person who studies de death and dying. David Kessler is uh, the person who co-wrote that very famous book with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross called On Death and Dying, The Five Stages of Death and Dying. He was speaking at this conference and at the breaks, at coffee break, at lunch, at dinner, maybe they'd gone out for an adult beverage in the evening, he said, all, all of a sudden, Whenever people came up to me, doctors, nurses, social workers, clergy, they all seemed to have a story about something that wasn't on the agenda that week. They wanted to talk about people they had been with at the time of their passing who had been visited by predeceased loved ones, some who had been visited by Jesus, some who had been visited from others who provided comfort, David Kessler ended up writing a book where he gathered up these stories from all across the country. And I would highly recommend the book if you're ever looking for something to provide you with a little comfort. The book's called Visions, Trips, and Crowded Rooms, Who and What We See Before We Die. It gave me a great deal of comfort reading it. In fact, in some ways, David Kessler's book reassured me about something Jesus had said 2,000 years ago. Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. And then Jesus said, when the time is right, I will come again to you so that where I am, you may be also. In other words, in the time of our passing, the curtain will be drawn back and Jesus himself will come to us and lead us home. Now, you may be sitting in your pew here in the sanctuary or sitting on the couch at home listening right now and saying, but Mark, you just told us about uh, loved ones being visited by predeceased family members, not Jesus. But it seems to me that Jesus might appear in any form that would give us great comfort in our darkest hour, a great deal of peace in our time of struggle. In fact, I remember this guy up in Cleveland, very powerful banker, kind of a neat guy, but uh, two weeks before he passed away, he was still at home, and his wife said to me, Mark, Bill keeps going into his study, and I hear him talking to the family dog. And I said, well, that's nice. The family dog's probably very, very comforting. And she said, yeah, but the family dog died five years ago. 
And I said, well, what a better way for Jesus to come to Bill than to come as this comforting family friend, this loved, beloved dog of the family. And I said, besides, don't ever forget, dog spelled backwards. Jesus said, I will come to you in that time. The curtain will be pulled back. I will find a way for you to hold my hand that I might lead you home. But for a moment today, I want to talk to you a bit about those who don't have those stories in their family, or those who deny those stories, or those who don't believe either in God or that Jesus himself is the resurrection, or in the resurrection itself. They don't believe in a life after life, a sunrise after a sunset, so to speak. For some people in this world, their vision is blurred to that kind of uh, eternal experience, the experience of the eternal breaking in on them. For some, they're afraid. They live with a great deal of fear. They fear that if God is real, and if the resurrection is real, then they just might have to be accountable for the way they're living their lives right now. It's easier to deny the resurrection for some than to face the truth that a day of reckoning may be coming, and they will have to account for the way they have lived their lives in the here and the now. I met a man a month and a half ago or so, my own age, maybe a year or two younger, he was about 56, 57 years of age, and he told me that he was dating a 19-year-old student at SCAD. And I thought, well, first of all, I'm very protective of SCAD students. In some ways, I feel like they're, they're very paternal for them. I feel very caring, and so it bothered me that he would just outright tell me he was living with one of these students. And I said to, to him, would you be interested in coming to church sometime? And he said, oh, no, 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 I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God or any of that. The church is too controlling. Uh, they're really getting in your face all the time. I have no time, no place for God. And I thought to myself, of course you don't. Because if you were to accept the reality of God or the truth of resurrection, you would have to be accountable for your immorality in the here and the now. It's easier for you to spend energy denying the resurrection, denying God, than face the truth about the way you're living right now. Now, some people don't believe in God or the resurrection because they believe in science. And, and please, don't go home saying Mark was bad-mouthing science. I'm all too happy about science. I'm happy that science has created medicines and treatments that help people stay alive. Many of you here in this room, I'm not anti-science. But I also know science has its limits. Science is usually about understanding the how of the world, not the why. And science is limited to the empirical uh, things of this world, things you can measure, things you can quantify, touch, feel. But it's not very good at exploring those things that are beyond the physical. That's where our faith comes in. People have a hard time believing in resurrection. Doctors are often quite quick to write off those liminal moments where the curtain gets drawn back. Oh, it's the medications they're on. Oh, it's it's a biological, physiological response to their dying. That's interesting to me, given that it's almost a universal experience that people have, regardless of what medicine they may or may not be on. So science has its limits. For me, though, the one that I struggle with the most is those who are claimed to be religious, but yet don't believe in the resurrection. Resurrection for some who claim to be religious are beyond the scope of their history or their understanding of the magnitude of God's transcendence, God's being eternal. Or it's just beyond, plain beyond their own imagination. And that's where we get to the Sadducees. Take a look at the Sadducees. That's who they are. They are the elite, old-school religious leaders of Jesus' time. They wield a great deal of power and influence in uh, their community, 
They wield great power religiously, socially, politically. They enjoy a certain status within the community. They are known as the keepers of the temple, a.k.a. they are the trustees of a very wealthy, powerful, old church called the temple. Not naming any churches in particular, but you all know of those very wealthy, powerful first churches in pretty well every city where there's a group of trustees that really manage the place. They enjoy a status. They, uh, they are at the top echelon, or at least they think they are. There's another group called the Pharisees. They're more like the elders, the deacons. They're the teachers, and they're the, 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 the kind of spiritual leaders. But the Sadducees, they feel like we have a grip on everything. It's up to us. Uh, the decisions that need to be made ultimately need to come through us. And the thing about the Sadducees is they didn't believe in resurrection. The Sadducees subscribed to only five books in the Old Testament. Of the 39, they subscribed to only five, the Torah or uh, what we call the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they said, we can't see anything about resurrection in the books that we narrowly focus our faith and our religion on. All that stuff about the prophets, the major prophets, we don't listen to that. Wisdom literature, we don't listen to that. Uh, minor prophets, we don't spend any time with, with that either. Only the first five, and we see nothing about the resurrection in here. So we have blinders on, basically, and we're unwilling to take them off to even consider anything about resurrection. Now, Jesus is coming to town. He's got this great following. People are really interested in this one Jesus, this one Jesus who they have yet to understand claims to be the resurrection. All they can see is this is someone who's messing with their power. This is someone who's going to upset the balance and they need to manage this. And their way of managing this is to trap Jesus, trick him, corner him, put him up against the ropes and kind of pummel him a bit with some sort of philosophical, theological question about resurrection. They say, Jesus, what a cockamamie a convoluted question they give Jesus, right? Okay, so you got this woman, and you got this guy, and this guy dies. And according to the Torah, um, she needs to marry uh, that guy's brother. And he dies, and she's got to marry the next brother. First of all, I, I'm always amazed. Like, what's wrong with these guys who keep dying? She's outlasted them all. But that was sort of the, um, the care program for widows in that time before Jesus taught us to care in the Christian community for widows. The care program in that day was, well, if you didn't have kids to take care of you, you married uh, your, your uh, husband's brother if your husband passed away. And they, they go all the way down the line, and it's almost seven brides for seven, seven brothers, uh, like the old Broadway play. But in this case, it's just uh, one bride for seven brothers. And they say, okay, if the resurrection's real, who gets her in the, in the resurrection? And Jesus is like, why you chauvinists? I cannot believe that you don't understand resurrection. In the resurrection, women are no longer property to be handed around the family like uh, a, a, an inheritance or a, a major responsibility that you have to take care of. In the resurrection, people no longer are marrying or given in marriage. There's a whole new kind of creation unfolding in the resurrection. We're not going to be our same old selves in the resurrection. I look in the mirror and I usually say, well, thank goodness for that. It's a whole new kind of social order in the kingdom of God. People neither marry or given in marriage. They don't have children in the resurrection either. And then Jesus, this very savvy first century rabbi, Rabboni, a teacher, gives them a theological answer from their own text. You only accept the first five books of the Bible. Well, let me tell you what resurrection is according to your first five books. And he tells them about Moses 
at the burning bush. Moses, who refers to God as the living God, and they know God is the living God, according to Torah. And Moses refers to God as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Jesus said, how can these be alive to our living God and there be no resurrection? To God, says Jesus, all are alive. To God, who is eternal, all are alive. You, me, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, all are alive. If we're living our lives in God. God is alive, God is eternal, and if we are investing ourselves in that one and not the things of this world, we are in effect becoming eternal with God. For Jesus' resurrection, his response to the Sadducee is less about us and it's everything about testifying to the greatness of God. It's almost as if Jesus is saying to the Sadducees, get your nose out of the dirt. Quit looking down to earth for your answers and lift up your head and behold the glory of God. God who is alive is with us now. God who is alive will be with us in the resurrection. My old professor N.T. Wright said that Jesus' response is less about what does or doesn't happen to us when we die, and it's all about testifying to God's eternal faithfulness, God's eternal power. It's about proclaiming God as Lord of all things, the living, the dead, and those who are being raised, and God is especially the Lord of the new creation. Okay, lest I get too heady and philosophical with Jesus and the Sadducees, What does that mean for us today? What does that mean? uh, What does resurrection mean for us who are, are living here in the 21st century? Well, if God is God of the living, and we are living our lives in the eternal power and the eternal grace of God here and now, it means that we can start living in the resurrection right now. We don't have to wait till we die. We can start living in uh, the freedom of the resurrection. We can live with peace. We can live with joy. We can live without fear because we know whether we live or whether we die, we belong to God who's got us all the time, even and especially right now. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And though people may die, if they believe in me, they're going to live again. And then he has this funny line right after that when he says, those who live in me, as well as believe in me, they'll never die. What Jesus means, if we're living in that mystery of resurrection now, if we're living with joy, with peace, without fear about what's coming uh, in the next world or the next day, then we are already participating in the mystery of the resurrection. You know, I saw a meme on Facebook yesterday. It was a photo of a tree that had fallen over. And I'm sure if people had seen it fall over at the beginning would have thought, oh, that tree is dead. But you know what happened? That tree had still had some roots going into the ground. And new branches started shooting up uh, from the tree as it laid on the ground horizontally. So one tree fell and all of a sudden four or five are now shooting up. And the branches are uh, sprouting out and they're filled uh, with, with green leaves. And underneath the meme, it said, the tree fell down, but it did not give up. That's what it is to live in the resurrection, to experience moments of heartache, sadness, and even death in our lives, but to know that if we're living our lives in Jesus Christ right now, we are still part of the new creation, and there is nothing on this earth that's going to stop that from happening. A number of years ago, a very dear friend of mine, the Reverend Dr. Dale Andrews, was diagnosed with liver cancer. Some of you who go all the way back uh, with me in my ministry, I'm looking around the room, uh, to the year 2020 might have heard Dale preach. He preached at my installation at Wilmington Island years ago. Dale was diagnosed with cancer in his mid-50s. And while he was meeting with the doctors at Vanderbilt uh, Medical Center, where Dale was a professor, 
One of the doctors said to him, the chief oncologist said, um, oh, I see that you're, you're a pastor and you're a Christian. And Dale said, well, yes, that's correct. And the doctor said to him, that, well, that's interesting. I don't believe in God. And Dale said, well, that's fine. Thanks for sharing. Um, but the doctor said, look, if, if you're saved from this terminal cancer, we'll know your God is real. And, and if you knew Dale, Dale is, is six foot plus and big 300 pound guy, just a big guy and deep, deep boisterous laugh. And Dale just starts laughing. And the surgeon says, what's so funny? And Dale says, friend, you don't understand. Whether I live or whether I die makes no difference. I am in the hands of God whether I live or die. That doesn't make God real or any less real. God is eternal, and I'm participating in that eternal life even right now. Well, you can imagine that poor doctor just didn't know what the heck was going on, how to make sense of that. I think that's what it is for us to participate in the mystery of the resurrection. It's not a mystery that we need to solve like we're trying to figure out a riddle or a puzzle, or like we're trying to figure out a whodunit on an old episode of Murder, She Wrote. It's a mystery that we, we come to embrace, a mystery that sets us free as we participate in it, as we live in the mystery. Those who live and, uh, live and believe in me, they'll never die. I am the resurrection, said Jesus. So as we live in him, even now, we are already becoming eternal with him. We are already participating in the resurrection. So I say, friends, let us live with peace. Let us live with joy. Let us live without fear. For we are living our lives in the hands of our good our gracious and our eternal God, who is Lord of the living. To God, all of us are already alive. Praise be to God. Amen. <laughs>